The Benjamin Dixon Show is only possible with listener support. Go to www.thebenjamindixonshow.com to register for our blog and join the Progressive Army. Today is Tuesday, August 4th, 2020. I want to start with breaking news out of Beirut, Lebanon. A massive explosion occurred. Uh, you could see video all over the Internet of a extremely large explosion um, rocking the capital city of Lebanon. Uh, it took place. The explosion took place at the port there. It started with small explosions and got larger. And then it got so large that it looks like it destroyed an, an entire block, if not more. Um, so far, we don't have any reported casualties, but I'm certain there's going to be um, uh, without question, there's going to be severe casualties in this. Um, hopefully people had a chance to get away fast enough to minimize um, the number of casualties, property damage. The buildings are crushed, cars are smashed, uh, windows. There's not a I mean, if you look at the explosion, it's ex- extremely intimidating um, people are speculating, but I, I don't want to engage in the speculation in terms of the the source of this explosion or the nature of this explosion. Um, but it should be on your radar as a major event that's happening across the globe right now. Um, by the time you download this and listen, I, I, w- I would estimate that by this evening we'll have the first casualty count uh, as far as how many people were killed and uh, we will update you as we get more information here. So stay tuned on that. Let's begin here domestically. I want to go over an article from Ken Klippenstein. I had a chance to speak with him yesterday on TYT's conversation. That episode will be out tonight. Um, but I spoke to him about his recent article on the Department of Homeland Security's attempt to label Antifa uh, as being sponsored by a foreign entity, a foreign power. Uh, and this, in this case, They are trying to link Antifa to a former ally of the United States, uh, which in itself is uh, the height of uh, some type of sick, twisted irony. Uh, But I'll get into that. I'll get into the portion of who they're trying to connect Antifa to. But first, I want to talk about the implications of what happens if they were successful in linking Antifa to a foreign power. Now, just to be sure, anyone who's listening, Antifa very simply means anti-fascist. At the core of it, it means anti-fascism. No matter what they try to label, no matter what they tell you, the core of it, the root of the founding of it, the original organization in Germany was an anti-fascist organization. And today it's an anti-fascist, anti-racist and anti-capitalist entity. It's not an organization. Uh, Just to give you a little more detail on it, the Department of Homeland Security intelligence officials are targeting activists it considers Antifa and attempting to tie them to a foreign power. This is according to TheNation.com. Again, this is reporting by uh, Ken Klippestein. Um, Brace Belden, who's a host of a left-leaning podcast called True Anon, he has been one of the targets of this investigation. Uh, Brace previously, previously fought in Syria for the Peshmerga against ISIS. Now, this is where I'll go ahead and tell you um, the, the entities that the Department of Homeland Security is trying to leak Antifa to. It is the greatest irony. It is. I don't know if it's irony even captures it. But the Peshmerga in Syria, northern Syria, has been the greatest ally to the United States in the fight against ISIS. Period. The Peshmerga, I think, I believe they sacrificed some 10,000 soldiers in the fight against ISIS on behalf of the United States. Now, uh, Donald Trump, when he came into office, he abandoned the Kurds in northern Syria. He abandoned them, pulled the troops out, not even the troops, but to pull the special forces out and left the fighters who had fought alongside the United States for years against ISIS, basically abandoned them. Abandoned them to the benefit of Turkey and their president Erdogan. And so that has been a major uh, plot point in the, the recent, I guess, year, year and a half. I'm not sure. I, I've lost track of, of all sense of time with regard, because of COVID-19. But when Donald Trump abandoned the Kurds, um, that, that was a major issue across the globe. And now not only has he abandoned them, but now he's trying to use them as a scare tactic tool and as a means of vilifying not only the Peshmerga, but vilifying Antifa. 
Stephen Aftergood, uh, who, who heads the project on government secrecy at the Federation of American Scientists, says this. He said designating someone a foreign sponsored can uh, as foreign sponsored can make a huge legal and practical difference in the government's ability to pursue them. It's a critical distinction. Once someone or some group is identified as an agent of a foreign power, they are subject to warrantless search and surveillance in a way that would be illegal and unconstitutional for any other person, U.S. person. The whole apparatus of the U.S. intelligence agencies can be brought to bear on someone who is considered an agent of a foreign power. So the practical implications of this designation is serious. Uh, And whether or not they can get away with it, it doesn't seem as though they will be able to get away with it. But the intention to get away with it suggests that Donald Trump wants to make good on his threat to label Antifa as a terrorist organization. The irony, of course, is the uh, the foreign power that they're trying to tie Antifa to uh, is a former ally of the United States. And uh, again, before I get to to that part of it, I I do want to say, even if they aren't able to accomplish this, it's a fear tactic. It is a political tactic of Donald Trump to try to intimidate and send a chill factor, the, the chilling effect down the spines of leftists, of people who disagree with them, people who disagree with this police state. It's very intentional, and uh, it shows the lengths to which this government is willing to go to acquiesce to the ego of Donald Trump. And not just the ego, right? So it is the ego of Donald Trump with regards to um, his efforts to label Antifa as a terrorist organization. But it's also the foreign policy of Donald Trump acquiescing, him personally acquiescing to another strongman, to, uh, to Erdogan, President Erdogan of Turkey. Um, who Turkey, obviously, if you follow this at all, you'll know Turkey has a contentious relationship, putting it very mildly with uh, the Kurdish people uh, in northern Syria because of the perceived threat that an autonomous uh, Kurdistan would pose to uh, to Turkey. And Donald Trump abandoning the Kurds in northern northern Syria has uh, given uh, gave rather the strategic advantage to Turkey, given Turkey the 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 freedom to move in into that region. Now, the abandonment was one thing. It is the fact that not only did we abandon our allies, but we are now vilifying them and using them for cheap political domestic points. Um, That is the height of treachery, in my opinion. Um, It it is the height of betrayal, Um, but it combined, it's combined with the, the petulant man child nature of Donald Trump in his domestic politics and the willingness to take a former ally, noble allies who literally put their lives, their bodies, 10,000 uh, uh, Curtis troops for uh, members of the Peshmerga and the YPJ and the YPG, 10,000 of them who died in the fight against ISIS. And not only did we abandon them, but now we are vilifying them and all for the purposes of labeling Antifa as a terrorist organization. I don't believe it's going to be successful, um, but it is creating a new narrative. And one of the most powerful things that you can have in this country is a narrative that people can latch on to. So now the country, you're going to notice, I I guarantee you, so long as Donald Trump continues to pursue this, you're going to notice more and more bellicose language towards the Kurds, towards the fighters, their troops, the YPG, the YPJ uh, against the uh, the Peshmerga. All for the purposes of satisfying Donald Trump's uh, ego and political agenda, domestic, petulant, petty politics. And this has again, I want to stress that this really has some serious implications. That means anyone who they can successfully link to Antifa and anyone who, if they're able to link Antifa to these organizations globally, then our civil liberties here in the United States are readily tread upon. Um, but the difficulty is, of course, Antifa is not an organization. Uh, there is no central leadership and, or rather, but this does not stop Donald Trump and conservatives and the conservative consensus here in this country from labeling everyone that they disagree with politically as Antifa and attempting to use this designation as a means of cracking down on political dissent, because this is what it is. This is an authoritarian move. This is pure authoritarianism and the attempt to bring everyone into subjection to the conservative consensus and to uh, to do the bidding and to the and to acquiesce to the ego of the man child in chief in the White House. Um, I 
want you to listen to this audio of George Floyd. This is new dash cam. I'm sorry, body cam footage from the murder of George Floyd. And it's long, but I'm only going to play the full thing is like eight minutes long. I'm going to play about 45 seconds of it so that you can hear from the very beginning how this brother was pleading for his life from the beginning and how the officers paid no attention whatsoever to his fears and his concerns, his legitimate fears and his legitimate concerns. I see your hands. Stay in the car. Let me see your other hand. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let me see your other hand. Please, Both hands. Put your hands up right now. Let me see your other hand. What do do? Put your hand up there. Put your hand up there. Put your hands on the wheel. Hands on the wheel. I'm sorry, sir. in the car. Put your foot back in. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. God dang, man. Man, I got shot the same way as I was before. Okay, well, when I say let me see your hands, you put your hands up. You got them? Dang, Put your hands on top of your head. Hands on top of your head. Hands on top of your head. Step out of the vehicle and step away from me, all right? Step out and face away. Step out and face away. I'm not going to shoot you. Step out and face away. I'm going to get out of here, man. Please don't shoot me, man. I just lost my mom, man. Step out and face away. Step out and face away. Please don't shoot me, Mr. Officer. Please don't shoot me, man. Step out and face away. You're not shooting me, man. I'm not shooting you. Step out and face away. Okay, okay, okay. Please, 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 man. Please, please. I didn't know, man. Get out of the car. I didn't know, Mr. Officer. I didn't know. Okay, um, there's a lot more to it. Um, the summary of everything that happens after that is basically they try to put him in a car. Um, he said uh, please, he begged them to not put him in the car because he's claustrophobic and he was afraid he would suffocate in the car. Um, and then the video switches over to where Derek Chauvin comes in and pushes his puts his neck, puts his knee on this man's neck for another eight entire minutes. And he dies. I wanted to let you hear it for yourself because of um the fact that they that this one number one this was over this was over a twenty dollar counterfeit bill, that's number one. This was over a twenty dollar counterfeit bill, and number two, you can hear from the very beginning that this man posed no threat. This man feared was was terrified. He feared for his life, and he was terrified. He was extremely terrified. Um, and he you can hear him mention in the clip that he had um that he he had been shot like that before and that he was he, i mean there's really no reason whatsoever for any police officer reasonable police officer to fear for his life in that type of situation he complied with them he complied with them and he gave them respect too much respect in my opinion i i probably i shouldn't say that but it was it was painful to hear him referring to them as mr officer he was pleading and begging for his life, and yet it was not enough. It was not enough to change the disposition of the police officers towards him. Keep in mind, this is over a $20 counterfeit bill. They had no indication that there was any type of weapons involved, no guns, nothing, nothing. There was no threat for this man to even have his this police officer to have his gun pulled out in the first place. You couldn't see the video if you listen to the podcast. He had his gun pulled out almost from the very beginning. And so here the officer is beg the, the, the George Floyd is begging the officer for his life and yet the officer began to get more irritated. Who gets more irritated when somebody is begging for their life? Who gets more irritated when the, when the man is clearly like like subjecting himself, genuflecting before this officer, pleading with him, referring to him as, yes, sir, Mr. Officer. Something that I just could not pull myself to do. I, 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 I'm not making any judgment against, against George Floyd. He understood the nature of the threat against him clearly because he ended up dying. But it just, it, it, it pains me to hear George Floyd have to beg and plead and show respect to these animals who had no respect for his life. 
That's why it pains me to hear him when he's saying, yes, sir, and no, sir, and Mr. Officer this and Mr. Officer that, and he's begging for his life because there was no amount of begging that would change the disposition of those police officers towards him. They had no concern or regard or respect for his life from the time they knocked on his window to the time he took his last breath. And even after that, even after he died, they still, Derek Chauvin still had his knee his, on the back of this man's neck. And so I, all the people who say just comply, the man complied as much as he could in a fearful situation. Whatever the cause of his PTSD, whatever the cause of the, of the fear, he had a justified fear because ultimately of what happened to him. I'm sorry. And, and, and what's extreme, what's even more irritating about this is that you have conservatives who have taken this clip and they have used it all night long, all day today to say that the officers did nothing wrong and that they, in fact, the officers did not kill uh, George Floyd because he was hysterical and he died of some type of hysteria versus the knee to the back of the neck that ultimately crushed the life out of him. That that's what's that's that's what's the most irritating this morning. Is that you have bad faith actors who had, they never had any intention whatsoever. I say this all the time. There are people that no matter what truth they see, they will spin that truth into propaganda for their purposes. They had no intention in Miles Chong. He has no intention of ever, of ever acknowledging the truth and ever allowing the truth to be a, a challenge to their paradigm, to their worldview, to their political agenda. The Andy Knows of the world, the Tucker Carlson's of the world, the Fox News of the world, the Sean Hannity's of the world, the Rush Limbaugh's. They will never under any circumstances allow a piece of evidence to challenge their political agenda. They will twist and distort it no matter what, no matter how you saw it with your own eyes. Heard it with your own ears. That this man was not a threat. That they had no reason to treat him in this fashion. That $20 worth of counterfeit bills is not a reason to execute somebody. And that when they knocked on his window, he pleaded for his life from the beginning till the end. But they didn't care. They killed him anyway. There are going to be people that despite the evidence that we showed them, they heard the video themselves. They, they saw the video themselves. They heard the audio themselves. And they have spun it as if these officers are innocent. When in reality, you heard it, you've seen the video and you know, if it shows anything, it shows that these police officers were sociopaths who had a complete disregard for the life uh, and the pleading of George Floyd, who showed no empathy whatsoever and treated this man as if he was worthless and useless and something that they could toy around with all the way to the point of taking his life. It shows their sociopathy. And, and, and despite the fact that the evidence is clear, it shows a complete disregard for this man's life. You still have some conservative apparatchiks, some conservative propagandists who will use this to say the exact opposite. These people never intended to do right by us in the first place. They never intended and in engaging in good faith. And we have to understand that. Welcome back to the Benjamin Dixon Show. Visit us online at TheBenjaminDixonShow.com. All right, folks, let's keep this moving. Yep. That's a vibe. <laughs> That's a vibe for sure, but let me, let me turn the music down a little bit so we can get right back to the news. Okay. All right, so out of Kentucky, Kentucky, Kentucky. Mitch McConnell has a commanding 17 point lead over the pick of the Democratic establishment, Amy McGrath, a 17, a whopping seven. Mitch McConnell, who is um, has to be one of the most hated politicians in this nation, not exactly the most popular guy in Kentucky, but popular enough to be beating the Democratic establishment pick, Amy McGrath, by 17 points. It's a done deal. She's not going to win. We knew this. We called this. We called this back when she beat Charles Booker. When she squeaked by 
where he spent a million dollars and she spent what? She raised like $41 million, lost her home county to Booker. You know, the, the bottom line of this, and I got a lot of phone calls about this. And so we're listening to some of those voicemails uh, uh, in, in a moment. But the bottom line about this is that the Democratic Party is sad, period, in the conversation. Dismiss, church dismiss. That's it. They're sad. They are, they, they will pick, they will call themselves choosing the safe pick every single time. And every time they pick the safe pick, they lose. They lose. I was speaking to John Nichols of the nation, uh, com yesterday. And he has, he's author of the book, the fight for the soul of the democratic party. And he outlines, he outlines like historically. Since the 40s, every time the Democratic Party goes with the corporate pick, goes with the establishment pick, they lose. Mitch McConnell is one of the most dangerous politicians in this country. To get rid of him would have been, one of, would have been second only to getting rid of Donald Trump. And honestly, if, you're, if, you're, if we're really sober about it, uh, Mitch McConnell has done probably just as much damage as Donald Trump. So I, I think they're an equal, I mean, it would have been an equal win to get rid of either one of them or definitely both of them. But the Democratic Party had to go with the person who's going to toe the, the, the establishment line, who's not going to shake the boat with regard to Medicare for all, who's not going to be a threat to uh, any of the establishment uh, paradigm, any of their uh, established uh, uh, policies, any anyone who's going to actually push the envelope in terms of a progressive agenda, a, a populist agenda, an agenda for the working people across this country. They, they would never allow that to happen. And yet and still, every time they make this type of pick, they lose. 2020 might be an exception only in the case of Joe Biden because of just how t- horrible Donald Trump is and because of how directly responsible Donald Trump is for 157,000 Americans dying and the tanking of the economy, et cetera, et cetera. But that's not going to trickle down to to Kentucky. It's not. When Barack Obama ran for president and I don't care how he ended. I mean, I do. Obviously, I care how he governed. That did matter. But for the sake of this conversation, people always the people always try to bring up the fact that, oh, he wasn't a progressive. We get that. He did not govern as a progressive, but he won in 2008. He ran to the left of Hillary Clinton on Medicare for all on the Iraq war. And he won. He galvanized an entire movement of people who wanted that type of policy. That is something that you win on those. Think of this way. How many times has the Democratic establishment lost since to since uh, uh, let's let's include Bill Clinton. Right. So they won in 92. They won in 96. They lost in 2000. They lost in 2004. They did not win in 2008. A progressive won in 2008. And then, of course, they lost in 2016. So in the last 28 years, the establishment, the centrist corporate wing of the Democratic Party has only won twice. You can't include Barack Obama because he ran as, as, uh, as as a progressive, as a populist. And so that conventional wisdom does not work on the electoral level. And we've seen them over the last, during the Obama's eight years. They lost a thousand seats across the across the country. Governorships, the, the House, the, 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 the Senate, the state houses and the state legislatures across the country. They just lost because the conventional wisdom of the Democratic Party doesn't win. The conventional wisdom of the Democratic Party stops progressives, but it does not win victories. And Amy McGrath who is an establishment pick there in Kentucky is set to lose in a race that was, that could have been won, that would have been a try a, a tremendous victory to get rid of the man who ensured that we got uh, Brett Kavanaugh who stood in the way and made sure that Neil Gorsuch was up instead of Merrick Garland on the Supreme court. The man who made sure that he did, he has done everything he possibly could to withhold any progress in this country, no matter what rules he had to bend. There's really very few people in Washington, D.C. who are more Machiavellian than than uh, Mitch McConnell. And yet the Democrats are are gearing up to to lose. I see excuses all across uh, all across the Internet. Um, people are trying to say that that they're just so much money that I, I mean, excuses are excuses. The people are not excited about someone who's telling them that everything can just be fine if we just keep everything the same. That's the bottom line. Nobody is moved by that. 
People need real solutions. And the real solutions are not simply for us to go back to the way things were. That will not work. And the only reason it may work for, for Joe Biden is because 157,000 people are dead. And because the economy has dropped. So 45 million people are without jobs. 25 million of them lost their benefits last week. So that's that's the reason the conventional wisdom of the Democratic Party might work this time, not because of their conventional wisdom, but because of just how excruciatingly pathetic Donald Trump has been as president of the United States. Go to www.patreon.com forward slash the BPD show and get twice the content and unfiltered interviews without any of the commercial interruptions. And here we go. At this point in every single episode, I'd like to take a minute to thank the people who make the show possible, our patrons. It doesn't matter how many patrons we get, we will pause to thank them. So a very special welcome to Maddie Malakopa. Thank you for being our patron for today. Now, everybody, just bop, yo. You too can become a part of this prestigious and prodigious patron family. By going to patreon.com forward slash the BPD show where you get twice the content, uncut, unfiltered, unedited interviews, none of the commercial interruptions. And you give me the ability to speak truth to power, whether the powerful like it or not. But more importantly, I speak power into the powerless, whether the powerful like it or not. Welcome back to the Benjamin Dixon Show. Visit us online at TheBenjaminDixonShow.com Yep. Right. Come on. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back. You can enjoy this experience, this uh, this show, without any of the commercial interruptions by going to Patreon.com forward slash the BPD show. And as you can see, it doesn't matter how many patrons we get, you know, even though I've, you know, you know, we'd like to have more than just one a day. <laughs> All right, let's get to the phone calls. Um, thank you for calling in 857-600-0518. Let's listen to what uh, the callers had to say. You can join the conversation as well. 857-600-0518. Leave me a voicemail and I will be sure to get your voice on air. Let's go. Hello, this is um, Gage. I'm from Elizabeth City. Got screens and all that kind of fun stuff. That's not important. Uh, my question I, I guess it's more of just an angry um, statement with Amy N- N- McGrath in Kentucky. Um, it just real, really, really feels like they actually don't care. They check Schumer and all them. They just don't really want to try to do anything. And it's getting more and more obvious because there are even here in here in NC, we have someone who is even more forgettable, Cal Cunningham, going against Tom Tillis. And the dude is always just talking his platitudes. Nothing. Nothing going on with actually what's happening in the state or the pandemic or the eviction or anything. They're not addressing any of that same thing with Amy. And that's why she's losing. I'm not saying McConnell is any better, but she's not. They're not trying. I mean... Schumer himself was sitting there, like, stroking it with Republicans over TikTok being from China, even though, like, the things they're announcing on, like, in the microphone and stuff are made in China. And, like, half the shit they have is made in China, but now they all of a sudden they have a problem with it, and they can kumbaya together in the middle of a pandemic when millions of people are about to be evicted. Millions of people don't have any income, and millions of people don't have health insurance, and more people are dying every day in the South. So I just don't – do they think this is funny? <laughs> Is my question because it really seems like they're not trying or they don't care. I, I, yeah, no, I don't know what else to say other than I don't think that they care. Here, here's if I were to give them the last, the last bit of the benefit of the doubt that I could give them. It's not, it's not to make them seem any better. It's to show you how foolish they really are. Maybe they do care. But they are just so, so stuck in the way politics operated for so long. It is, it is, okay, I can, I can answer this better, better with a story. <laughs> um, if you're on the, if you, if you are a patron, you got a whole crap load of stories out of me yesterday. Here's a quick one. My favorite movie, it used to be 
the most neoliberal movie of all time. Um, the American president with, um, what's the guy name? He plays the, the, uh, Michael Douglas, Michael Douglas. Anyway, the American president. And the reason I bring that up in context of this is because we used to have an image of politics in our mind that allowed that vent not only allowed for, but actually venerated the Chuck Schumer's of the world, the Joe Biden's of the world. Right. The type of the type of politicians that um, that Pete Buttigieg was trying to become. We used to make movies about that stuff and we used to watch them. Now, this isn't to say that there weren't any leftists and any socialists back then who knew better. But the vast majority of America didn't because we had been lulled to sleep by this new type of politics that. Um, maybe it wasn't so much new, but it was new for a new generation. And it was just the pomp and circumstance and the civility of the pomp and circumstance of Washington, D.C., the nerd prom, the course White House correspondence dinner. You know, we were we were lulled to sleep by all of the um, all of the glitz and glamour of Washington, D.C. And that allowed for a type of politician that was more concerned about if we could get along than actually doing something. That's all of the benefit of the doubt that I could give these people. I don't think that they care. I agree with you. I don't think that they care. But I think more precisely, I think they're a bunch of dinosaurs who are stuck in an era of politics that don't work anymore. And the Republican Party got the memo 30 years ago that this politics style was something that they could take advantage of and move this country towards their right wing dystopia. Meanwhile, you still have people like Chuck Schumer and Joe Biden who are sitting around trying to get a scotch with the Republicans after after they had a vigorous debate on the floor about the crime bill. So I don't think that they care, but I also think that they're trying to get back, you know, to a time where Washington, D.C. was was glamorous. And now it is a it is a rhetorical war zone. It is a uh, a war zone of it's an information war zone. A, a, a world of propaganda and a, a world of political agendas that are insidious, that need serious action. All right. Before I get to these next voicemails, I want to drop in one other story. Donald, uh, not Donald Trump, but Barack Obama um, sent out a list of endorsements, a long list of endorsements yesterday. And none of his endorsements included members of the squad. It didn't include uh, AOC. Um, more importantly, it didn't include Rashida Tlaib, who has a race today. Uh, who has an opponent, and it didn't include uh, Ilhan Omar, who has a race today, and she has a well-funded opponent. Um, I want to drop that in there because I know a lot of the voicemails are about that issue. So let's get to the next voicemail. Yeah, this is Trent Coleman from Greenville, South Carolina, calling in my little bit of feedback. Um, to see the Aaron McGrath from Kentucky lose isn't surprising. It's kind of like when you're in the NCAA tournament and upstart almost beats the juggernaut. They lose, but the next time you see Juggernaut go to the next stage, they lose immediately because they're also weak. I mean, it's pretty obvious that you're not who you say you are. And as far as Obama not endorsing AOC and the rest of the squad, um, I think it's more strategic. Obviously, he's not very popular with the left anymore, so to come out and endorse them would probably put more water on their fire than benefit them. All right, man, take it easy. I like that comparison. I, I like that comparison of uh, of the – uh, of the startup, the underdog team who just just barely misses their opportunity to get to the finals, and then um, then that that behemoth of a team, that establishment, the established team loses. Um, we see that all the time. The difference is is that that this is this is so this is about the lives of people. You know what I mean? I, and I know the caller. You know that. I'm not saying that you you miss that, but I just want to say the uh, the stakes are so much higher. The stakes are so high and, and the Democratic Party continues to play these games. Um, uh, in, term, in my opinion on the Barack Obama issue is, you know what, to hell with him. I, I'm sorry. I, I, don't, I don't care one way or the other what, what they do at this point because Barack Obama and, and, and his wife, Michelle, I, I love them still. I like them. Um, I, I, I like them, but they are the last uh, first of uh, the president and first lady of the glamorous America of that glamorous White House, right? The glitz and glam that I talked about, the one where the White House correspondence dinner was so 
so important and it, the worst thing that we had to worry about domestically were uh, them violating our civil liberties. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just being an asshole. But but it was the appearance that everything was fine. Meanwhile, underneath it, the insidiousness that gave way to Donald Trump was active, active. It was it was in motion. It was happening. Um, and so I think Barack and Michelle are the last president and first lady of that era where uh, where everything was nice and, and docile because it had the veneer of glamour on top of it. Uh, now we're dealing with some hardcore issues and we're dealing with not just the hardcore issue, but the times are different. The times are so different today than they were at the end of Barack Obama's term. Uh, so I don't really care what they have to say, who they endorse, uh, because the world is totally different than when they were uh, in the White House. Hi, Ben. This is Drexter Bernhard Drax. Uh, we follow each other on Twitter. I'm calling from Munich, Germany. And I just wanted to, I don't know if it makes you, makes you guys feel good, my American friends, that we too here in Germany have tens of thousands of uh, death cultists demonstrating uh, last Sunday in Berlin. The numbers varies between 17 and 25,000 people uh, in Berlin were protesting against government intrusion. And one thing that is big here is a Bill Gates conspiracy that Bill Gates wants to diminish the world population and is um, basically killing people with whatever a vaccine he's going to come up with. Uh, it was really shocking. I watched a live stream of one of those guys, and it's really the the end game of of neoliberal uh, capitalism. The guy was uh, there without a mask, surrounded by people, screaming their heads off, and uh, it, it was really shocking and depressing. And, and my last point here is what, what everybody's thinking about moving forward. Uh, let's say things get better. What do you do with with these people? who are uh, so uh, wrapped up in this cult? How do you actually reintegrate them into society moving anywhere? You know, because they, they won't shed this, this, this madness. I mean, it's a, it's a, psych, it's a mass psychosis, but um, I'm not telling you anything new. I, I love your show. You're the best. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Listen, that's a, that's a difficult question. I don't know what we're going to do with these people. Honestly, don't know what we're going to do with these people who insist on. Uh, OK, so there's a myriad. There's a large group of people that we're going to have to really talk about. Those people who have made a political decision that it, it has the same results as those people who are making the conspiracy theory decision. Right. That Bill Gates is trying to control the population and then or, or that somebody's going to put the mark of the beast in the vaccine. And if you take, you know, that side of the equation. But then you also have like uh, down there in Georgia, I saw a picture. I shared a picture on uh, on Facebook today uh, from Paulding County, Georgia school. First day of school was today and it is jam packed. The hallways are so jam packed with people and maybe maybe out of like the 100 people jam packed in this hallway, maybe 10 have on a mask. And they are the those are the children of people who made political decisions that are going to have the same ramifications, the same results. People are going to die. This virus is going to be here. We may not make it out of our houses and back to normalcy until 2022 at this point. But to your question, how do we get back to I mean, what do we do? We have to. I don't know, man. I do. We have to confront them. We have to fight. We have to draw the line. We have to we have to alienate them. They have to be relegated to the dregs of society. That doesn't mean that they don't have their rights. It doesn't mean that they don't have access to platforms. It doesn't mean that, you know, we arrest them or anything around them. No, it just means that your opinion is such anathema uh, that you should be uh, excoriated. They should be relegated to the dregs of society, period, in the conversation. Because what they have done has contributed both politically as well as conspiratorially, if that's a word, um, they have created the conditions that are going to exacerbate this virus for years to come. Um, and that's going to lead to the, to the deaths of so many more people. Um, so we have to, on our side of the equation, we have to just normalize shaming them. I'm sorry. We have to normalize shaming this level of conspiracy that is leading to destruction. 
and we can't have concerns and these worries about, uh, about cancel culture. F that. People are dying. People are dying. And if we're more concerned about canceling the individuals who are contributing to their deaths, then we are complicit with those deaths. Next caller. Hey, Ben. Jelani from New Jersey. I'm calling about Obama not endorsing the squad. I don't understand how a group of people who have very strict litmus test would even want to be endorsed by a guy who has been called a war criminal, a human rights violator, and multiple other things. That's just my view. I don't think Obama should have endorsed them when they speak badly on his name. Well, let's be sure about a couple of things here, right? So, no, they it is not simply a litmus test, right, that, that these individuals, they are just presenting a more progressive agenda, an agenda that is progressive both domestically and internationally that does look down on the droning of the president, of, of Barack Obama, the fact that they droned uh, and, and bombed the people into oblivion, right? And so whether or not they, they, their campaigns desired the endorsements, I don't know. That's between their campaigns and, you know, if they asked Obama for an endorsement, that's between them. Uh, but I do think it's noteworthy that uh, Barack Obama, who is still probably the most influential person in Democratic politics, chose to personally not get involved in the campaigns of these young progressive women. Right. Which shows. At the core, this is more about Obama than it is about those campaigns. Maybe those campaigns would have rejected it. I, I don't know. But in terms of Obama, it shows that he does not put the qualities that he talks about, the values that he talks about, he does not put those first. He puts the party, the establishment, the corporate wing of the Democratic Party first. So this isn't about them. This is about Obama. And I'm sorry. Whether or not it, it should, you, if all of the stuff that Barack Obama talks about in terms of uh, uh, of progress, all the stuff that he talks about in terms of a, you know, it's not a black America, a white America, it's not a red America, it's not a blue America, it's the United States of America. All that stuff that he talks about here, he all he talks about in, in trying to latch hold of the future of this country and the future of the Democratic Party and the future of progressive politics, all the power that he wields to continue to have influence on that. And this man could not could not bring himself to endorse the people who leg who legitimately are the future of this party. Well, if nothing else, it just gives us complete uh, uh, permission to be like, screw you then, bro. If you think the party, if you think the future of this country is the opposite. Let me rephrase that. If you don't see that the future of this country is rooted in the politics of AOC, Ilhan Omar, and Rashida Tlaib, then that means that you are one of the people we got to move out of the way. And this is not to venerate those three. It's to venerate the style of politics, the appeal to the people, the appeal to, to the populace, Right. The push for a more egalitarian society, the push to actually do something for the working people instead of just running our mouths and giving uh, pandering talking points to the people. That's the future of the party. And Barack Obama said that he didn't he didn't see fit to endorse it. That speaks volumes about his character, not about theirs. All right. Let's take a couple seconds break and then we'll be back right after this. Welcome back to The Benjamin Dixon Show. Visit us online at www.thebenjamindixonshow.com. All right, um, let's keep it trucking. Let's keep it going. I, I, I want to go back to this Obama thing really quickly, right? Uh, because I think it's important. I think it's important because it's not just, it's not one of those things of, well, let's just leave Obama alone, right? Because that's the category of person that that's where I am. My my thing in general is, you know, just leave him be. He was president. He didn't do what we needed done. Um, so he has a venerated position. 
in the hearts of not just the black community, but just like hell, like most Americans, uh, the majority of Americans, I think, love Obama. You have, of course, conservatives who hate his guts, but still, even some of them will prefer Obama. They, I mean, he's in a category of, to me, of just, just leave him alone. With, the, with one major exception. And that's when he engages in the politics of today. I'm sorry. You being the president of the United States four years ago does not qualify you to be, uh, to be able to influence the politics of today without our critique. In other words, if you get into it, then you in it, right? And if you get into it, then we have to evaluate not only what you did while you were president, but how your politics fit in 2020. So while I would love to just leave Barack Obama alone, the active act of not endorsing the people who are taking the, I mean, nobody takes more heat than Ilhan Omar. She takes more heat than AOC and Rashida Tlaib. Both of them take a lot of heat, but not as much as Ilhan Omar. And they do so, uh, the three of them do so on behalf of fighting for working people. And for him to actively not endorse them. That's a problem. That's a problem because of the nature of the politics that we are engaged in right now are uniquely different than anything Obama dealt with. Not saying Obama had it easy, by no means. But I do want to just give you this case in point. They, the Obama wing of the Democratic Party and the Clinton wing of the Democratic Party regularly endowed the office of the presidency with more and more and more power. They, the powers that Donald Trump used in Portland, that was granted to him by Barack Obama. Um, the kind of propaganda that we're dealing with right now, that's a result of, of the Clinton administration, right? We're dealing with the world that was crafted by the likes of Barack Obama and Bill Clinton and, 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 and the Republicans. We're not letting the Republicans off. But the reason I bring that up is because Obama trusted that the American people would not elect someone like Donald Trump. That was the blind spot that he had. He could not believe that America would ever go back or consider electing someone as grossly incompetent and malevolently authoritarian as Donald Trump. And so these type of Democrats continuously poured power into the office of the presidency, giving him authorities that that really transcend what the Constitution ever recommended, ever allowed. Because they never thought that America would go back to some type of 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 repugnant beast like Donald Trump. But we, yeah, America did. America absolutely did. And we're paying we're paying the price for it right now. A couple more voicemails. Hey, it's uh, Ellie from Washington, D.C. I'm uh, L-Train87X on Twitter. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, talk about how like Obama didn't endorse uh, the squad. It was like, I mean, to me, that's like typical Obama. He does not, you know, he does what's popular. He's not, he's not going to be a pioneer in creating a new wave. He's going to just latch on to whatever's hot or popping at the moment, which is why he endorsed uh, Jamal Bowman, you know. There was no clear challenger. He didn't come out for him in the primary, he, you know. That's uh, why he's not endorsed. I mean, and, and it is telling. He hasn't endorsed AOC or Rashida Tlaib or, you know, Ilhan Omar, who are popular among liberals, I think, because of their identity, not so much their policies. But it, it's it, it's like Obama's shown us who he is, but for some reason people or, or some, I don't want to say many people, like, you know, there's a, Perception, at least maybe among the uh, the um, powerful class, that like, oh, well, he's a progressive, and you know, he's just very forward leaning. He's not a forward leaning person, and, and I think people, progressives and leftists are just going to keep have to hammering that home until it really sinks in. Because I think part of the issue is they think, well, that's as left as you can go, and anything beyond that is insane. Progressive, Bernie Sanders, progressive is insane. Socialist is insane. Communists are insane. Rap anarchists are insane. But you know, I mean. It's it's just telling that, you know, it, it should be obvious to everyone by now that, you know, he's not someone of real conviction, but 
whatever reason, that, that image of, you know, Obama's great because he can speak in complete sentences still persists. So, like I said, keep being persistent until that breaks down. So that's all I want to say. Thanks for that call. And listen, and, and again, I, I am in the category of people who just say, let's leave the man alone. Right. Just leave him be. Let him enjoy his legacy or, or let him enjoy his retirement or whatever you, you want to call it. But the things that are happening today are so critical that everybody who had a role in building in, in this, this system that Donald Trump is manipulating and, and, and capitalizing on. Um, and then those people who did not have the foresight to see that Donald Trump could win. Um, and those people who thought that the status quo was just good enough, they're not qualified to lead us in this moment. And, and I, and that, that's, that's the most important takeaway of, out of all of that. A few more voicemails here. Hi, Kevin calling from Allentown, Pennsylvania. I just wanted to make a quick comment about two things. One, the whole Trump, a DHS trying to, uh, link Antifa to the special murder. That's hilarious. Um, it's also probably going to be their way of screwing around to making the protesters, you know, domestic terrorists. <clears throat> and controversial take, I don't think Biden's going to come in there and reverse that whole situation. I think they just they, they won't care that much. And that it also suppresses any kind of protest movement that would be under Biden's administration. That's my opinion. Hey, Ben, what's up? This is all. Uh... Oh, I call him Albany, Georgia, man. Trump drive out of Albany, Georgia. Anyway, man, I was calling him uh, just to put this out there. I know the general consensus is everybody want to get Trump out of office and all of that, and I, I agree with that. Um, but my concern is the backlash from these white supremacists or, I mean, basically uh, just white people in general as, as far as the violence that may ensue following a possible Trump defeat. Uh, me, myself, you know, I'm, I'm promoting that us as black people get our gun game up. Now, uh, just, you know, just to be clear and put the nuance to this, I'm not a gun nut. I hadn't bought a gun since 1999. I've been, I was like 22 years old, you know, but uh, about two weeks ago, me and my wife went over to the Academy of Valley in Jordan, you know, so I could, you know, purchase a few firearms or what have you. Uh, but to my chagrin, I was put on a 30-day waiting list because I hadn't bought a gun in so long. And if you ask me, I think it's a calculated effort to kind of keep guns out of the hands of black people. Uh, because I know this, that day me and my wife were the only black people in the store. So white people in there, they get prepared. And they prepare for something. But I don't think that they're going to take a loss lying down. I don't want to be a soft target. I don't want any black people to be a soft target or any people in general, white or black, uh, that's not on the, on the Trump train. But in any case, I, I know, well, I assume that you're really not a, a gun enthusiast or really not, you know, I know that y'all for gun reform and all of that. Uh, but in this case, I think we need to, uh, go ahead and get our gun game up. So, you know, just let me know what you feel about that, man. Thanks for that call. Listen, um, I am <laughs> times have changed and and I am one not to uh, what my dad always taught me, always reserve the right to change your mind. Um, I have not been a gun enthusiast in the past, um, but I am most certainly in favor of us arming ourselves. Um, all all of us, black folks, especially. I share your concern. The time I spent down there in Georgia, I know that some of these people are going to lose their damn minds when Donald Trump loses. I know Ahmad Arbery would probably be alive today if he had, a, if he was carrying a gun with him. I know that it just makes no sense for us to unilater unilaterally disarm when uh, we live in a country as violent as we do that thrives on weapons. I also know that every gun that we, that we, uh, that we purchase empowers the people that we're fighting against, but that's a necessary evil at this juncture. I think you hit on something that we don't talk about a lot. These people aren't going to take a, de a Trump defeat lightly. They're not. I, I don't know to what extent they're going to go. I know, you know, the talk about the second civil war and all that is uh, talk from them, right? This is talk from conservative circles. I accept that pretty much as hyperbole and exaggeration and just 
you know, hyping themselves up. Um, but just, you know, see, you saw how they reacted when Barack Obama won. Imagine, you know, you saw how they reacted, how violently they reacted when Donald Trump won. With the, the, the right, uh, what was it, the, uh, uh, the United Right, whatever that march was in Charlottesville with the Nazis that killed Heather Heyer. That was in reaction to a Donald Trump victory. What do you think these clowns are going to do in a reaction to a defeat? So I'm not, I, you know, I don't want to engage in fear mongering here, but I do think it's wisdom to be prepared for all eventualities. And if nothing else, be prepared to protect your family. Um, and, and that has been an evolution for me because while I have been in favor of gun control, I think at this time, at this juncture and in this place, like you got to be prepared to, to, to protect your family uh, in these tumultuous times. Listen, everyone, thank you so much uh, for all the voicemails. I have more voicemails. I'm going to get the rest of the voicemails in the patrons episode uh, that follows immediately after this. Um, You can always join the conversations. I usually can get in about seven or eight voicemails in each episode, 857-600-0518. I will be posting and discussing the topics um, for today's show. I'm going to try to get those out starting at like 10 in the morning or even, you know, as early as eight in the morning. Uh, when the fall schedule starts here, uh, we are shifting the show a little bit. We're getting back into video. Video will begin next week. Video will begin next week. I'm excited about that. Um, and so there's just going to be a lot of growth in the content that we're sharing. A uh, full hour and a half content for patrons. Patreon.com forward slash the BPD show. Um, be sure to go over there and to subscribe to support the show. Every dollar that you give helps grow the show. Um, but also I want to stress, I want to hear from you. One, one of the things that I, um, um, I liked about the original show when we first came out years ago, you can go back on YouTube and you can see all these videos, uh, where we had callers, just live callers. And, and while we're not doing live callers, we can still get to hear your voices. One of the things I prided myself on, uh, was the fact that our audience is brilliant. The people who are in the Benjamin Dixon show audience, you all are brilliant and sometimes the best takes of the entire episode came from a caller. Um, and, and so I, I just want that, that tradition to continue. And the best way for us to continue it is for you to call in 857-600-0518. Uh, coming up in the Patriots episode, we're going to discuss these uh, images that came out of Georgia of uh, the first day of school uh, where kids are stacked on top of each other. But more importantly, I'm going to talk about like the commitment that, that people have, the commitment that people have to this system, even unto death. Uh, people are committed to their politics. Politics has become uh, something that people see as worth dying for. And I'm not, I'm, not talking about, I'm not talking about civility here. I'm talking about wrong information that is weaponized through hyperpartisanship that now people are willing to die. And not only them, they're willing to send their children out into this because of their politics. Like that's a level of commitment uh, that I don't know that if we're equipped for. Uh, I mean, that's that's some serious equipment. That's some, <laughs> equipment. <laughs> that's some serious commitment. And, and it's something that we have to take in consideration as we calculate our approach. These people are willing to not only die themselves, these people are willing to sacrifice their children. So what does that say about our politics, about what we're fighting for and and how we're fighting for it? I think that's a very significant consideration in the long run. Uh, and so we'll discuss those things. Listen, thanks so much for being a beautiful audience. Uh, again, I want to hear from you, 857-600-0518. Leave me a voicemail about the topics uh, and, and, and what you're watching in the news. Because if you're watching it in the news, there's a good possibility that I'm watching it in the news and it will be on tomorrow's episode. 857-600-0518. Thank you for being a beautiful audience. Patrons, stay tuned. Everyone else, go to patreon.com forward slash the BPD show or I will see you tomorrow. Take care. The Benjamin Dixon Show is only possible with listener support. Go to www.patreon.com forward slash The BPD Show and support The Benjamin Dixon Show. If you like this episode, be sure to share, like, and subscribe.